Good morning, folks. This is House Corrections and Institutions Committee. Uh, this is Wednesday morning. We are shifting gears and putting on our corrections hat. And this morning, we're going to be working a little bit on S18, which is a bill that deals with good time and the carve out for some folks uh, who are currently incarcerated that have been convicted of some crimes that they may not be entitled to good time as we go forward for those folks who are currently convicted. Um, I just wanted to spend some time this morning again as background information for the committee members on good time, how, what the law is, how it is implemented, and then we can look into S18 as we go along. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Eric Fitzpatrick, our legal staff, um, to give us a walkthrough of the good time law. And I know we have some documents posted on our webpage, and I'm assuming that the first one would be looking at the current statute of good time. So Eric, I'm gonna turn it over to you. And if you could identify yourself for the record, that would be great. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. This is uh, Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Counsel. Um, here to speak with the committee about the good time statute, as well as any other questions the committee may have on the legal process of how it works and how that may interplay with Senate Bill number 18, which uh, proposes some amendments to the good time statute. As the chair was mentioning, uh, I emailed a couple of statutes, including the current good time statute to Phil, and he posted them on the committee's webpage. But I wasn't sure, question for the chair, I guess, whether you want me to just sort of talk about it a little bit to start with. Would it be helpful for the committee for me to pull up, share my screen and pull up the statute and walk through that in that context? Um, why don't, I think we all can see this, the document on our computer, so we wouldn't need to share, this, share the screen. If sure. that works for you, Eric. And I think the thing is, is to walk us through the current law. Yeah, great. And if there are questions, if there are questions of the committee as we go along, please raise your hand because I think that would be helpful to engage in a dialogue with Eric on it. Okay. Excellent. Sounds sounds good to me. So, uh, as the the chair was mentioning, there is, and as you see in front of you, there is a good time statute on the books currently. Um, that, uh, as you see right from the very beginning of it, uh, that the statute. And the legislature had delegated some authority to the Department of Corrections to implement this program by rule as well. So uh, you've got two things from a legal basis going on. You've got the statute and you've got the rules implementing the details of the program. And uh, my understanding is that those rules went into effect on January 1st of this year. So you have a good time program that's been in effect and operating Oh, for I guess I would say almost going on three months now, two and a half months anyway, actually pretty close to three months. And so what is the good time program is the obvious question. What does it mean um, in, in the sort of the big picture context? What it means is that uh, someone who's an inmate, someone who's under Department of Corrections supervision, has the ability through the good time program to earn reductions in their sentence, a reduction in their minimum and a reduction in their maximum, uh, provided that they essentially um, comply with certain conditions. And the main conditions are that you don't commit any major disciplinary violations uh, and you don't get uh, reincarcerated back into uh, back into a facility if you've been out in the community. Um, and and uh, in other words, that you don't violate your conditions of release and get reincarcerated. So if you are able to do those two requirements, comply with those conditions, don't, uh, don't uh, get charged with another with a major disciplinary violation, and don't get reincarcerated from the community because of a conditions of release violation, then you're eligible to earn good time. In other words, to earn this reduction in sentence uh, in your minimum and your maximum. And the amount that you could earn, what's for every month that you uh, comply with those conditions and don't, don't commit any violations, you can get seven days off your minimum and seven days off your maximum. So that's the amount that you can get reduced, assuming that you essentially behave well, right? Um, so the, the uh, seven day 
minimum and the seven day maximum doesn't necessarily mean that a person automatically gets released to that. Remember, I'm sure as, the, as this committee has worked with um, the parole statutes quite a bit over the years. And what that means is that uh, someone, once someone achieves their minimum, they're able to go before the parole board and um, and hopefully from their perspective, they try and make an argument they will hopefully be eligible uh, for release on parole. Now that doesn't mean though that they automatically will be. That doesn't mean that the parole board uh, grants uh, the parole status to every person who appears before the board right away. All, all the good time program means is that if you think about it, since you're eligible to come before the parole board when you reach your minimum, if you're getting your minimum relief reduced by seven days for each month that you comply with conditions, what that means is that uh, your minimum will come up sooner, right? If you've gained some time during good time, if your minimum was five years, say, and you've earned uh, uh, six months worth of good time, then instead of coming in before the parole board for the first time after five years, you come before the parole board after four and a half years. Everybody see that? So that doesn't mean, though, that you automatically get released after four and a half years. It just means that you get to come before the parole board sooner and argue for release. That may be granted, it may not be. Uh, but um, that's, the, that's the way that the, the uh, gaining of good time uh, can affect a person's eligibility for release. They become eligible sooner. So um, that's sort of the big picture without looking at the statutory language yet, but that's kind of the big picture of how it works. But it's important also to think about, and I have, maybe I know everyone has it in front of them, but to look at the criteria for participation in the program, because the next question that might come up in folks' minds would be, well, is every inmate eligible for good time? And the answer to that is no, not everybody, but mostly. Mostly, but not everybody. So uh, when you look at the, the language of uh, 28 VSA section 818, and that's the good time statute, section 818, uh, specifically subsection B talks about uh, the standards that create the universe of who can uh, qualify for good time. So in other words, who's excluded from the program and who can participate. And if you look at that paragraph, paragraph 1B1, that tells you who, who this universe is. So it's available for all sentence offenders, including furloughed offenders, provided that the program's not available to, and then it lists a couple of groups. Who's it not available to? Offenders on probation or parole. So if you're already on probation or parole, you're not gonna earn more good time. Uh, if you're eligible for a, a reduction of your term already under the work camp statute, now that's a separate statute that if you're in work camp specifically, you can get a 30 day reduction if you meet essentially other criteria. So if, you, if you're already getting your sentence reduced under that statute, you're not gonna also qualify for good time in other words. Um, and lastly, uh, offender sentenced to life without parole. So those are your, your groups of folks who, who by statute, can't earn good time. It's the ones who are on probation or parole, you're, on, you're getting your sentence reduced through this other work camp program, or you've been sentenced to a life without parole uh, on the basis of a life without parole uh, offense. And uh, speaking practically, there are not a lot of offenders that get sentenced to life without parole. So, so that basically, uh, uh, other than that small universe of offenders, uh, that whatever crime you've committed, you're you would still be eligible uh, to earn good time. As long as it's not, you know, murder and, and some of the aggravated sexual assault offenses. Other than that, you generally don't see life without parole. So, uh, so, so Eric, that's the, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Why don't we stop there? Because that might be a good stopping point for questions. And I also sure. want to make clear to members that when a person reaches their minimum, they're eligible doesn't mean that they're going to be released, but there's an eligibility there. This is way beyond good time. It's way it's been established for a long, long time. So there's two ways that a person could be reviewed 
for eligibility to be released once they reach the minimum. One is what Eric mentioned, which is going before the parole board to be directly paroled. They're entitled to a hearing before the parole board when they meet their minimum. And that would be to go directly to parole. Parole is under the jurisdiction of the parole board, not DOC. But DOC has a say in that hearing before the parole board on whether or not the person is a good candidate for parole. That's one vehicle. Another vehicle is the person's also eligible for furlough. Furlough is granted by DOC. Furlough is under DOC and the conditions are set by DOC, not the parole board. Furlough is interpreted as an extension of the incarcerated walls if it's almost like there's a shorter leash on the person where there are conditions that are set by corrections and corrections has more oversight of someone on furlough and because those conditions can be stricter than what you would find on parole um, there could be more violations and DOC would pull the person back in so that's how a an inmate, once they reach their minimum, they are eligible. Doesn't mean they're gonna be released, but they are eligible. And they're eligible for furlough. They can be eligible for parole. And the statute allows if they are on furlough, they're released on furlough. The statute allows, because that is termed as an extension of the incarcerated walls, they would still be able to receive their good time if they abided by the rules. So again, the onerous is on the inmate for that, not on DOC. It puts the onerous on the inmate. So are people clear on those mechanisms? Because that's really important to understand as we go forward. So we have some questions here, Michael, Linda, and Kurt. Yes, uh, uh, Eric, just um, I can't recall who testified with us before. I'm just so it's kind of a repeat question. Just want to reaffirm it in my own mind here. In addition to this, I've been talking with one of our state's attorneys in the district because I kind of bridged two, two different state's attorneys, so to speak, but um, talking about with him about good time. Um, one of the things I assured him we were speaking to is not only is it obviously good behavior, but I believe there's, and I think people in prior testify that there's a yardstick or programs that the inmates are in or subjected to that they have to demonstrate um, progress or progression towards becoming better mem members that are going to assimilate back into society, so to speak. And I would hope those mechanisms are in place um, because his one of one of them the concern was is you know is somebody just a good actor and putting on a good face and then you know still behind the facade a, a bad actor you know what I mean you know am I making sense? Yeah, yeah, I understand the the point you're you're getting at exactly. Um, I think probably that's a question that's going to be better directed toward Monica and and how the DOC implements that program uh within their within their facility um okay less of one that really has to do with the statute itself but but right uh, yeah it's a, a very valid question valid point that uh, i think um she probably would have some good information on okay why don't you hang right. on to that one Michael? yeah sure no we'll see if she, she addresses it thank you hmm. uh linda kurt and scott linda um thank you hi eric um, so you um, described as, you know, in section B1, the offenders who are sentenced to life without parole are part of that carve out. But I think from, I would ask for a little bit more clarity for maybe the committee, because there are a group of people who may have been sentenced to life without parole who went into plea bargains. And when they went into plea bargains, they are now entitled to see if they are eligible. So that I think there's a subpopulation there that we should all be aware of that are now going to be considered for eligibility. 
And I think that's going to be what S18 also addresses. Are yeah, you I following think that, me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a good point that uh, um, just because a statute has life without parole as the penalty doesn't mean necessarily that every individual person charged under that statute got that sentence. They may have plea bargained to something less than that. And um, if, they, if they did, then you're right, they would be uh, eligible for, um, for good time sentence reductions. If they were, for whatever reason, they were unable to plea bargain, maybe you know, because of the nature of the crime, who knows, but if they were actually sentenced to life without parole, then they wouldn't qualify. But that's true that not everybody who co commits a crime that has life without parole as a possible penalty necessarily gets that penalty. They, um, it's quite, quite regular that they would be able to plea bargain for a lesser penalty. And if, and if they did that, say, whatever it may be, 40 years, whatever, whatever the penalty they, they agreed to, then they would be able to earn good time. That's right, that's a good point. That's all done in the courts. That's exactly right. Yeah, their, the their, their, their counsel the and the state's attorney and the judge all have to approve the, the plea right. agreement. Yeah. The victims have to approve to the plea, plea deal as well. And yeah, I think they're also one of the, one of the parties that's consulted and uh, they get input via the state's attorneys. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I just want people to be very clear that happens within the court system, within the judiciary, with all the parties. It's not in DOC's world. DOC just houses them. The sentence is given by the courts. Right. DOC deals with the sentence as it comes to them from the court. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Kurt, Scott, Karen, and Michelle. So Kurt. Uh, yeah, two things. Well, three things. First of all, is my mic sounding okay? Yeah, yep, sounds good to me. That's all right. <laughs> I think the problem before was my battery was getting low. So let me know if that happens again, if I sound like I'm underwater or something. But anyway, uh, two things. Now we're down to two. Um, I think it would be helpful, Madam Chair, if you or somebody explained what happens at a parole hearing in that um, with regard to the victims and notification and things like that. I just don't want to get ahead of trying to understand good time first. I understand what you're saying, Kurt. I don't want to confuse the committee with all these different layers of furlough and parole and, and all of that. What I, I don't want to lose track of what you're saying. I think okay. it's important. I just want the committee to understand the mechanics of good time before we get into all these other nuances. Okay, uh, then we, we can get to that later. Um, the other thing is I really, what what is this I really think the name should be changed. What is this being called? This looks to me like it's earned time. The new bill gives a new name to good time. And, and calling it? Earned time. We will get there. I want right now, because we have such a new committee that wasn't here for the last two years when we really did the nuts and bolts of this program. I want the new members to the committee to come up to speed so that we can understand what's being asked in S18. So there is a new name for good time, it's called earn time. But currently right now, the statute is earned good time. Okay. So I'll hold that for later as well. You're way ahead of us, Kurt. Well, I'm only slightly ahead. Anyway, fine, I'm done then. That's good, okay. thanks. Scott, Karen, and Michelle. All right, well, yeah, I'm one of the new people who's still confused. Um, I wanna go back to the, uh, to uh, uh, meeting the minimum sentence and being able to go to the parole board um, and, and how that works with furlough. So when can, a, when can an offender or an inmate uh, ask for furlough? They don't ask. They don't ask. No, they don't okay. ask. They are eligible. Okay, are what, what eligible. Well, all right, then, then that's the, they don't so, ask, and maybe we can go to Monica for this in terms of what delineates when they go to furlough or when they go before the parole board. Okay, and yeah, what, what, yeah when let's that happens. Can, let's see if we can get there. Yeah, so, that would be good. Uh, 
And if you could just identify yourself for the record. Yes, of course. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Um, Monica Weber. I'm the Administrative Services Director for the Department of Corrections. Um, I may also ask Dale to help with this question. Um, but essentially, <clears throat> the two things you're talking about, parole eligibility and furlough release eligibility, are triggered by the same thing, which is a person has reached their minimum release date, right? So both at at that date, there's sort of like um, a fork in the road. You could you could imagine where they could be released on parole and they could be released on on furlough. There are a lot of, as you mentioned, Representative Emmons, a lot of decisions and processes in place around which with path that you you take. Um, they are becoming a little bit more similar based on some of the justice reinvestment uh, changes that were made in Act 148. And I know you don't want to get into extensive detail, which of course you know we, we can do, but I, if that answers the question, then we can. Um, well, that answers the or... question about when. Um, okay. So when they, it's when they, they reach minimum sentence, they can either go to the parole board and, re and, and request parole, right? Well, there's a statutory requirement at their minimum release that the, that the parole board reviews their case. So that's, that's a step, that's in law. Okay. It's a review, but, it's a review, Scott. It's not saying you're gonna be released. No, no, I got that, I got that part. Okay. Yeah. But, 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 but uh, now, um, how is it decide, determined that the, that the parole board, or is the parole board make, de, make, making the decision about whether this person is eligible for parole or, or, or furlough? Okay, so the parole board makes the decision about the parole release um, and the department submits um, a parole summary. There's a form that we fill out that provides them with information that helps to inform their decision-making. They only make the decision about parole. The department, the department makes furlough release decisions. And we can do that at, at, a same, at the same time, essentially. Um, and so we will we'll send someone to the parole board, the parole board will make a decision. Um, and we can also decide something around furlough. Dale, do you wanna add to that? It's, but it question, sounds like I think one of the things that you need to clarify, can you be on furlough and parole at the same time? You cannot, you can only be on one status at the same time. So if, for instance, people can be denied parole and we could, we could decide to release them onto furlough. Okay, so, but, and furlough is, for lack of a better phrase, a tighter leash than, than parole. Is that fair to say? I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you, your question. It's a tighter um, well, release, is that what you said? Tighter leash. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a. Uh, well, a, I would, I'm, Dale, why don't you take that it, answer? It, it used to have much more uh, disparities between furlough and parole with justice reinvestment. Um, they have really come a lot closer to each other. Um, to understand, you know, really between our three main legal statuses, furlough, probation, and parole, it's who is a decider on the conditions and violations, right? So uh, parole board decides what happens to violations if someone gets on or off parole and what happens with the violation. Furlough, it's the department that makes those decisions and probation, obviously, it's the court. Um, so hopefully that kind of clarifies those are the three big kind of buckets that, that we deal with as far as legal statuses. Yes, um, and we've uh, heard that several times, and it's beginning to sink in. But, um, but I guess I'm still I'm still trying to focus on um, person meets their minimum sentence, and by statute they're eligible to be reviewed by the parole board. Um, does the department also review them for for furlough at the same time, automatically, or or is there a statute around that, or how, so, how do so what happens is when an offender is approaching their minimum sentence, uh, we, we, we review, make sure they've completed if they have to do required programming, um, if there are any concerns or risks to the public, we have kind of our, our criteria. Um, while um, at their minimum, individuals are eligible for release on furlough and eligible for release on parole, um, they are not necessarily appropriate for release. So, so those are decisions that we have to, to make. Generally, the, the, if an offender does what 
uh, is required them in the facility, they will be released at their minimum. Um, the, the courts create the sentence and, and the department just tries to apply the sentence the best we can, um, be it that public safety is maintained. And, and I guess just one final question. Uh, does the department um, do, do the department make their judgment um, uh, independently from the parole board? In other words, do these two, two things happen independently? Right. The parole board is an independent body. So the parole board has paroled individuals that we did not recommend and they have not recommended individuals via parole. They are, they're an independent body. Um, they do but align with us quite often, but with our recommendations. Okay, yeah, but, and, the, and, the, and the decision making around, uh, DOC makes a decision about furlough at the right. same time that yeah. uh, the parole board is making, making a decision about parole. Those two decision making processes are independent of each other. Not always. <laughs> Not always. <laughs> we, we've kind of changed a little bit with JRI. So we start our, we do recommend at a greater frequency for parole now. So we start our release program, or not program, but our release process, it includes both. So if someone, if the department feels we're going to release this individual on furlough, we, we start kind of that process and the parole process at the same time. Um, uh, we, you know, one of the uh, outcomes and recommendations is to increase our census on parole while decrease our census on furlough. And this is one way we're doing it is by recommending at a greater frequency. Um, we have modified our, our uh, supervision requirements on furlough to much more match what is on parole um, as far as contact standards and intensity of supervision. It's really based on risk now and, and legal status has no bearing on the intensity and the, and the structure of supervision requirements. Okay, well, maybe maybe I had to suggest one more question, and that is: Is there any difference in cost to uh, managing or supervising a person on parole versus furlough? Is, or, is it, or is it the same? Uh, not really, as far as a, a cost goes. I, I I would probably indicate that furlough may be minimally more, depending if they have electronics. But parolees, we can put on electronics. Um, uh, really, in the state, there's very little difference between the populations. It's based on risk. Um, the one really big advantage of parole is the interstate compact that the offender can actually relocate to a different state and still be supervised. That's not an option on furlough. Is that the major difference between the two that's then, effectively? That's the, and the other major difference is that furloughees will get good time or earned reduction of time while parolees don't. Those are the, the two main differences as far as structural. I mean, the deciders are still the parole board and the department, but as far yeah. as the, those are the real differences. Great, thank you very much for the information. You're welcome. So Karen, you had your hand up and I see it's down. Is that? Yeah, I think I was getting ahead, so I'm okay. happy waiting. Michelle and then Kurt, I see your hand up. Is it up again or is that from previous? It's up again. Okay, Michelle. That's it. All right. So my first uh, thing is, I just wanted to to uh, respond to Kurt's uh, concern about the good time term. We didn't make that up. That's uh, that's a term that's used all around the United States. I think there are twenty six states that have good time. So I think it's fine for us to revise the name to come up with something we like different. But it is sort of a known entity um, in a lot of states. So so there's that. My question, I'm not sure who would be the appropriate person to answer it, but I was hoping maybe one of you could speak a little bit to when the parole, uh, when the parole board is reviewing a person who has become eligible for parole, um, what kind of factors do you consider besides the, the, um, the person's behavior while they were incarcerated? So for example, we had some testimony from some parents whose daughter had been murdered under very violent circumstances. And the sentence for the person who killed their daughter, I believe was 42 years to life. So when the parole board is gonna be determining at say 42 would be the minimum, what are they looking into? Do they go back and look at the original crime when they're considering whether or not the person would be released? Or is it only based on the behavior uh, while, the, while the individual was incarcerated? That's, that's really a question for the parole board. Um, what I can tell you is we would write a parole summary and they'd have all the information from the offense and the crime committed 
up to their behavior, treatment compliance, and supervision under the Department of Corrections. They do have their own risk assessment, um, but that's really a question geared toward, uh, I'd say, Dean George, the chairman of the parole board, um, as far as what they make their determination for. Um, I, I think, you know, my, you know, my guess, it would be kind of all of the above. Victim impact, victim safety, they would look at compliance under supervision, risk to the public, uh, progress and treatment. Those are things that they probably would look in, but it's really a, that's really a question for the parole board. So do you have any idea in terms of people who are sentenced to many, many years sentences to life, how often do those people get out? Do you have a sense of that? Because to life certainly means that they've committed some kind of offense that, that is you know, justifying a long time. Is that common for people to get out if they have a two life sentence before, you know, or not? Uh, I don't have the numbers, but um, if someone will have a minimum and a maximum, they'd be eligible for release at their minimum. Um, so it would really depends on that, that minimum release date, uh, the risk and the compliance and the treatment progress that that offender has, has done in the facility would determine if we would release them or not. They'd still be eligible for parole and eligible for furlough at their minimum. That was the sentence that was imposed by the court. Um, but it really, it, that's, it, it, that's really an open-ended question. It's, it, it, it's individually based. We do have a number of individuals that have life sentences. We have a few that have, I think, very few that have life to life. I don't, I'm not sure if, if, if I'm, I'm talking three or four, but we don't, we don't have a lot of those. Um, so hopefully that kind of answers your question. It, it, and we can probably, I'm, I'm assuming Monica could probably find the number of individuals we have with a life max. Uh, I don't have those numbers off the top of my head. Thank you. Kurt, and then Karen. Yes, uh, this is another one that you might, you can decide whether we want to address it now or later, but sometime in our discussion of the Senate's changes, I, I would like to have a review of why we ended up reducing minimum and maximum mm -hmm. and not just one or the other. It was quite a discussion and I can't quite remember why we did both. You know, I know we had quite a discussion and I think we all agreed it should be on both. I don't recall, Sarah, do you recall anything specific on that? I know we were trying to decide do we do minimum and maximum and we figured that we would do both. I, I can um, offer my recollection is that we heard from the council and state governments about what was going on nationally and how Vermont compared to some other states and what were some best practices around that. And I know we had a lot of discussion about that and that informed our decision. Yeah, I think um, I, I think it may, well, I'll probably bring it up again when we talk about the um, Senate changes. Cause I think it, it has something to do with that but we can wait till we talk about their changes. Monica, do you wanna weigh in on that? I see your hand. Well, I would, I would just note that um, I think part of the conversation was also around some of the already existing um, time, for instance, the camp good time that's already in statute, which also applies to the minimum and the maximum. So creating a, a program that was um, not entirely disparate um, for people. Okay, so we got more questions. Karen, Sarah, and Michael. So Karen. Yes, I don't know if this is a question, maybe more of a comment to help frame because um, I, I don't feel like I understand fully, but being kind of part of the system for a while, you get these aha moments of understanding. And so to clarify for me, like it sounds like the release planning system, it's just a complicated, complex, multi-layered system where when folks meet that that um, minimum date. And with the good time or earn time piece, we're basically just considering opening that door sooner. It's, it's that door is already there. And you know, it, like that's a whole system that's complicated and messy. It's already what it is. We can talk about that discussion, but what we're talking about with good time is, do we open that door sooner for folks? 
Is that a good way to, is that accurate in how I'm describing it? On some level, yes. I think, um, understand that as of July 1, we've, re we've eliminated some other legal statuses. So our complicated release system was a little bit more simplified um, to everyone's benefit. Um, I believe the reason the previous question around the good time for both men and the max was twofold. One, reintegration furlough was repealed and that was uh, an earlier release than minimum. That was a pre-minimum release. Um, it didn't work, it wasn't very effective. I think part of the, the logic behind the good time for the minimum is to address that behavior in the facility as good time is um, a tool used to influence positive behavior. Um, so the, the minimum is really what drives the incarceration behavior, incarceration population, and the maximum is what drives the community supervision population. Um, and I do believe it was a recommendation from a group that was advising uh, the bill on, on good time as well, as well. Hopefully that answered your question. But yes, I mean, the good time does um, open the door, so to speak, um, and, um, and on the flip side, closes the door when someone maxes out sooner if they're compliant. It's seven days per month, so, that's, so it, it can uh, reduce the sentence quite a bit. So let me clarify a little, make sure people understood what Dale just said about minimum maximum. To get to your minimum sentence, you are incarcerated. So if you have the good time off, for both your minimum and maximum, as we do now, the incentive for the inmate to behave while they're incarcerated is that they will receive good time towards their minimum, which means they will be eligible to be on furlough or parole sooner. Once they are furloughed out, if they're furloughed out, not paroled, but furloughed out, they can still earn good time in the community. And the incentive there is to behave because those earned days off their sentence will come off more of their maximum than their minimum because they've already reached their minimum sentence. So it also puts pressure on the inmate or the offender in the community to behave because they have something to gain, which is time off their maximum because they've already reached their min. So that's behind them. So they have a goal ahead of them of their maximum sentence being reduced by those days that they've earned by abiding by the rules saying, doing what they said they would do and abide by the rules that they agreed to. So it still puts the onus on the offender, not DOC. So that's why we have, that's the good distinction in looking at minimum and maximum. Okay, Sarah and then Michael, I saw your hand went down. Do you still have a question, Michael? Okay. Sarah? So Madam Chair, my question is a little bit different. Um, I wanted to make, I'll, I, and you can say if we want to hold this off till later, but this is a question I think that Eric might be able to answer. Um, when we passed um, Act 148 um, and we, we, with good time, you know, we heard from the Defender General that um, he had a legal opinion, and I'd like to hear your legal opinion on this. And that is um, that when we when we passed Act 148, we gave people this the 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 right to earn this good time, and that by taking it away, um, it could be teed up for if, if we were to take that away um, uh, for people who had were incarcerated when this law and it, when this law passed, that that could tee it up us up for a constitutional challenge. And I just, I'd like to hear a legal opinion about that because I think that um, that's important to know uh, with, with this, with S18, for me anyway, if like we're just, if we were to address this and try to change the law that it really just could, could, could create this, uh, this challenge. Yeah, um, um, I am familiar with that issue as well. And the, uh, the, it was discussed down in the Senate Judiciary Committee 
also. Uh, in a nutshell, the, the legal claim, and you may, we haven't got to the bill yet, but you'll see that, that uh, it's essentially an ex post facto idea, an idea that you are um, uh, retroactively uh, increasing someone's penalty. And you think, well, how is the penalty being increased? It's, it's being increased, uh, or at least one theory, the Defender General's theory would be that it's being uh, increased because uh, as of January 1st, right, when the program went into effect, everyone who is eligible for the program sort of gained a right to participate. So again, this goes to S18, it doesn't go to the current statute, but the theory is that uh, that because you, you may recall that S8, under current law, the only offenders who can't participate are those who are sentenced to life without parole. Whereas under S18, that has a list of six, six or seven offenses uh, who, of folks who, who, while they can participate going forward, they're not able to, if they've already been incarcerated, they can't earn any more good time. So uh, that could be viewed as taking away a right to earn good time that they accrued as of January 1st, 2021, when the program went into effect. On the other hand, uh, the attorney general argued that the program was defensible under, the, under that argument, because if you think about it, uh, the, the folks who are eligible as of January 1st were not eligible when there was no good time program in effect. Right, which was for quite a long time. So uh, the, the attorney general thought that the program could be defended because it's not taking away a right that someone uh, has, it's returning them to the status that they were before uh, the program went into effect. And in that sense, there's no laws. It's just returning to the same status that they had before. So, uh, you know, I can't tell you what a court's gonna say in response to that argument, I would be, I would be very surprised if it wasn't litigated. <laughs> it's absolutely going to be litigated, of course. It's a it's a valid argument, um, but you know, uh, both sides have their theories, and it's going to be up to a different branch of government to decide which one is right. And you know, as the, the famous famous saying that uh, attorneys often say is that um, uh, the court the court is not. Uh, um, final, they don't have the final word because they're infa infallible, but they're infallible because they have the final word. <laughs> so, you know, they'll have the final say on. <laughs> we'll see you in court. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I appreciate that. That's that's helpful to kind of just get as uh, as I'm not an attorney. So to get understand the legal landscape of this is helpful. So thank you for that. Yeah. I mean, if it passes, I'm quite certain it, we'll hear more about it when it reaches the, the judicial branch. Mm -hmm. So we still have a couple of questions, Scott, and then Linda. I think this is fairly short. Um, can a person be uh, reviewed for parole prior to reaching minimum or furloughed prior to reaching minimum? They must reach minimum before they're eligible for any either of those. We, we do have medical furlough and parole. Uh, and we'll just leave it at that. I don't want to complicate. Don't okay. complicate it, Dale. <laughs> That's <laughs> fine. You don't this have to. Is normal <laughs> furlough, normal <laughs> furlough, and normal parole. Please. Yeah. You must reach minimum to, to be uh, right. considered for each, either of those. Okay, thank you. Uh, Linda. Um, thank you. Yeah, I was actually going to address um, Representative Coffee's question as well with um, what Eric said. Um, and I know the Defender General has his argument and the Attorney General have theirs. So, but pretty much it's my understanding that the legal scheme is go that's going to be applied that would revert back is going to be what was the committed offense at the time. So it just takes it to the status quo with actually no more severe punishment. And everybody could sue. And, you know, if you lose the first time, you're done. Um, and so it's going to be in the judicial system. But the bottom line is, it, it's my understanding, and maybe Eric, you could clarify this, 
that the way SA-teens question is actually being presented, the fix that's being presented, okay, um, it actually doesn't change the offender's punishment at all, making it more onerous. And had it done that, there would be an issue. But because it doesn't, and the punishment is only applicable at the time of the offense, that that would be the attorney general's argument. Yeah, I think that's their argument, exactly. Okay, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. So what I'd like to do, I know that there's more to the good time law um, that really deals with victim notification, the remaining piece of it. Could you just quickly go over that, Eric, and then we'll transition into Monica and Dale in terms of how good time is really implemented through the rules? Yeah, sure. There, There is, uh, as the chair mentioned, there is some uh, language in the existing statute that does uh, require some victim notification. And that is at the very end of the statute, uh, subdivision four, uh, requires that the department uh, ensure all, all victims of record uh, that they are notified of the Earn Good Time program at its outset and that they are made aware of the option to receive notifications from the department. In other words, notifications uh, that uh, uh, someone's term is gonna be reduced, their sentence is gonna be reduced um, and that they may be released sooner. Now, again, that's, that's not necessarily saying that the victim uh, would receive that notification, it's that they're being aware, made aware of the option to receive it. So they could choose to receive it, they could choose not to. Um, but uh, uh, I think that it's in that sense, uh, like you said, uh, Madam Chair, it's more of a question for, for the DOC folks as to how they implement that. But uh, I think it sounds to me, it reads to me like an opt-in program so that uh, if a victim doesn't opt in, then they wouldn't, wouldn't be getting that regular notification um, as long as they are notified of the existence of the uh, program at the outset. So. Uh, I think so, you'll see, sorry, go ahead. No, well, the reason that we did that was we heard a lot of testimony from the victims that, that for each notification that they would receive of the inmate receiving good time, they sort of at times are feeling re-victimized. So that's why we put in the opt-in. It would be up to the victims to determine if they themselves would like to receive those notifications and on a regular basis. Because some, yep. some victims would and some would not. So that's why we drafted the language as we did for that. Right. So, Eric? so I think an interesting question of, of, of the existing statute is how did that, uh, how did that uh, affect, because you know, it's easy to see sort of going forward um, how you know, with a new offense that's committed after the after the program went into effect, you know that those victims of record are part of the court proceeding can be uh, identified and located. I'm not sure how this would have applied to um, to past offenses, say from years ago. Uh, does that mean that the victims from that offense five years ago have to be contacted and notified that the program's in effect? I'm, I'm not sure because. But that's an important factor to keep in mind because that's that goes to some of what you'll see in S18. Mm -hmm. I think on our committee's end, it was notifying um, victims both of past offenses and also going forward. Right. That's the discussion we had as a committee. We were very cognizant of that and we're the ones that put in this language to make sure the victim's community was notified and aware of when a person's receiving earned a good time. So it applied both to those who are currently sentenced and then also those going forward. And I think part of the issue that occurred is when the rules started being promulgated, started being discussed, there was a lot of confusion in the community, the victim's community between rules <laughs> and statute and when the rules take effect. It seemed like at the beginning when you go through the rulemaking processes, a lot of public meetings, public hearings, 
um, before the rules are implemented. And I think what was really happening was confusion in that when they first were notified of um, public input for putting together the rules, the people felt that, oh my God, it's now in effect going forward this immediately, which was not the case at all. So that's where some of the confusion and um, pushback came from. Right. So Kurt? Uh, yeah, I, I know I've been told before, but what is the meaning of when we get a um, printout like this, where it's italics and red, as opposed to, I mean, does that mean it? That, does that You're mean it was, there was a? You're on the bill, S18, correct? Oh, okay. Yeah, we. We're I can wait. <laughs> We're not there yet, Kurt. All right, I'll mm -hmm. wait. Sorry. Okay. Um, so, Eric, do you want to finish going through what's in statute here for victim notification or not? That's Just pretty much, there's also uh, requirements that, uh, that's the victim notification piece, but there's also requirements about the department notifying the offender. Remember, that's always been in past uh, iterations of the Good Time program. Um, the computation and notification of the offender was a very complex process. So there's language in, in the same paragraph in subdivision four that the department's supposed to provide notice not less frequently than every 90 days to the offender anytime they get a reduction pursuant to, to good time. And they have to maintain a, a system that documents and records the reductions um, and uh, ensure that victims who want information regarding changes in scheduled release have access to that information. So that's the last piece of the victim notification element of it. So victims who want information, again, who have opted in, uh, have a, uh, a, a way to access information about any early release that's gonna happen because of good time. So we wanted to make sure that all parties knew what they were uh, accruing in good time. We wanted to be very clear. When we put this um, in place a few years ago, a couple of years ago, we had some goals we wanted to meet, that it was transparent and that good time was easy to implement. That's really what we were looking at because the previous good time uh, programs were very difficult to interpret and um, we didn't want to go down that path. We wanted it to be very clear and simple and transparent. So I'm going to now shift to DOC uh, to talk about how this all gets implemented through the rulemaking process and maybe do a little deeper dive in how it is carried out. Eric, before. Just a, one last thing, because uh, uh, Representative Evans, you would ask me about this last time, and this is also sort of goes to the existing statute a little bit, it's for, just for a moment. Remember, mm -hmm. you had been wondering about how does this good time interact with the new uh, presumptive parole system? Yeah, and, I didn't want to get I didn't want to get down that road yet until people understood good time <laughs> before okay. we throw them another <laughs> another curveball. Another curveball or another right. fastball. Oh good. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure I wasn't I wanted to make sure I wasn't skipping a question if you wanted oh, to. I just I want to hold off on that because that's going to provide more confusion. <laughs> Great. All right, we'll come back to that one. <laughs> yes, thank you. Sure. So Monica and Dale. Good morning. Um, Representative Emmons, I, I would like to understand where you'd like where you'd like me to start. Would you, do you want me to start with the rule and what we and where we are with rules and then move into uh, what we're currently doing for um, implementation? I, I, I just want to make sure I start in the right yeah, place. I, I want to do what makes sense. What? I could go either way, but I think if you talk, why don't you talk about how you're currently implementing it because you're okay. under emergency rules. Right. And then we can transition <clears throat> into how we go forward with the rulemaking if we need to. I really, okay. I really want the committee to know how the good time is being implemented. At Great. This point. So um, 
as as mentioned, um, Eric went over the statute and the statute required the Department of Corrections to file an emergency rule so that we could begin implementation of the earned time program on January 1st of, of this year. Uh, so the, earn, the emergency rule is in effect right now. It, uh, emergency rules are in effect for 180 days. So that's, that's the uh, authority that we're operating under at the moment. Uh, and it is um, relatively straightforward in terms of um, saying, okay, we're gonna look at, I'm gonna use January as an example. So starting January 1st, um, all of the inmates who were eligible by statute um, could start to earn. And it is um, by month. So we go through January and then starting in February, we will um, do an analysis and a review of all of the inmates who would be eligible um, and see if they, if we had to screen them out for any reason. Now, in this case, um, people are screened out if they had, a, they were adjudicated, um, which means that we actually went through a, a, a process and found them guilty of a major DR, or they were returned um, from community supervision for um, furlough on a technical violation, as long as it wasn't because of losing housing, um, if it wasn't their fault. So we, we begin, we come up with this list um, in February um, and the sentence computation unit goes through the entire list um, and will manually apply the appropriate number of days based on um, the list to the person's min and max sentence. So the rule has um, a uh, proration chart. For instance, if you were sentenced and you started in January in the middle of the month, you know, we would be able to apply you some partial days. If you were only there for, for 15 days and you um, were able to um, get through the month without uh, being screened out for a DR, you'd get four days off your min and max instead of seven days off your min and max. So that's the first thing. I just want, I, I really want to take this kind of slowly. I want to stop there and see if there are any questions about what I said. There has been, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm working in two different issues right Understood. now. Understood, yes. This is my third issue right now. Okay. Um, Marcia. So I'm following you, but I'm having a hard time. Okay. So Marcia. And Monica, just out of curiosity, how many of them earned how many of them earned their earned time and were there any that got drs that didn't okay i i do have that information for january so knowing I knew you would. You, knowing that you would ask <laughs> so uh in january <clears throat> 1361 people earned uh, uh an award and a credit 174 people did not because they had DRs. And that was in January? That was in January. Have you figured out anything for February? I don't have February data yet. I mean, I, I, there is a delay, right? So we need to wait for the month to end. Uh, then we have to do the, the work to make sure that the, for instance, um, the DRs are closed. Um, then we need to apply um, the award. So there is a little bit of an administrative um, time gap here. And I think the way the, the statute's written, it, it allows that um, because you know the notification to um, offenders um, and DR is that 90 day window. DR I'm sorry. Is it just, uh, so that's if someone has um, violated a facility rule, um, a major um, a major violation of a, of a facility rule. So it's a disciplinary report. It's a shorthand. Uh, okay, term, I, I, thought, I thought so, but thank you. Yeah. Uh, Kurt and then Linda. Uh, <laughs> Ms. Weaver, by any chance did you get a number for the number of people who fit the criteria in S18 as those that are um, would be excluded from good time? I sure did. You probably want to know it. Um, I, uh, 
<laughs> so so yeah. understanding, right, this, this probably changes from, you know, o- over time. But the number that I have uh, for January is that there are, are essentially 297 people who received um, a, an earned time credit in January who have a disqualifying offense that would eliminate them from receiving that credit if S18 passes. Okay, that's what I wanted. Thank you very much. Oh, one more thing. Um, when I believe that when the rulemaking was made that uh, DOC figured this would, the change of in good time would re, um, necessitate hiring another staff member. Is Correct. that is that the way it's worked out? It have you sure had has. To? Yes, we have. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, Marsha, do you still have your hand up or was that from before? Oh, I just had a just a figure here. You said thirteen hundred and sixty-one earned all seven days. I said that. Well, okay, I, they earned their time. Most people in January did re- get seven days off their min and max. There were a few people who had partials, so two days or four days, but a substantial amount were seven days. If if they had all received seven days, that'd have been nine thousand five hundred twenty-seven days off. That's a lot of days not to you know. That is saved that will, uh, will in the end save the state money. Huh? Say that again, Marsha. 1,361, if they all had earned seven days off for the month of January, that's 9,527 less days that people will be incarcerated in the end. So I'll stack up to a lot in a year. But you're taking all 1,300 plus. Yeah, I know. She said that some of them got two days, some of them got three. Yeah. yeah. But I just think- just to, you know, to throw it out there to show you what, what it's going to do. But if you put that down person to person, because I think it really is person to person more mm-hmm. than a lump sum, because everybody's in there for different length of sentences. The maximum any individual could earn in a year is 84 days. Right. It's 84 days. It's two and a half months off a sentence per year. That's your maximum. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that you're going to, like there was, what, 124 or so, the head DRs? 174. 174. 174. Mm-hmm. They're not getting anything. So for that month. For that month. And, you know, so that's where it, it's hard to, to say when they're definite eligibility date will come up. It is different for each individual inmate and it's up to them to earn it themselves. Mm -hmm. It's not automatically given, which I think is an important distinction because there was one time way, way back, it was automatic. You got five days off regardless. Oh, really? Yes. And then we extended that where you had to earn it and you could get five days off automatically and then you could get up to 10 days off if you earned it. So we were almost 15 days a month. So there's been so many reiterations of good time and then we got rid of it back in 2006 or so. Um, So you know, this, this program that we put in place right now, it's not automatic that a person's going to receive that time off their sentence, that earned time. It is not automatic. It is up to the inmate to abide by the rules. And then it's a carrot and stick approach. And it's a management tool <clears throat> as well for DOC them as well that it really helps in the management of a facility when inmates feel that um, they have uh, some some input in terms of the length of their stay it's up to them to abide by the rules and in turn if they abide by the rules it makes for a safer facility and it's safer for our other inmates and it's safer for the staff So where are we? Because I got distracted by a few things here. Well, I would, uh, well, I was just 
kind of going through the basics. The the other um, point I'll add to this is um, of that group, 1,361, um, not all of them were incarcerated. Again, people on furlough are are receiving this. So there are people who are in the community already who are who are receiving their award. Um, so Monica, for the 174 that didn't receive it due to DRs, those were incarcerated folks, correct? Correct. Okay, just to be clear. And of the 1361, do you have, um, would it be about 1,100, 1,000, about 1,200? Right. 1,300 incarcerated, so if 174 had DRs and didn't receive it. So yeah, if it's, if it's, um, Really relevant and it's something that you need to know. I can certainly get into that level of detail, but I, I don't. I don't have the number off the top of my head. I'd have to look at. I'd have to do some additional analysis on my spreadsheet. Okay. Uh, Karen. Karen has a question. Yes, I just wanted to confirm something that I thought I just heard that of the 174 that did not earn time. Um, the assumption is that they were all incarcerated, but they could be some folks who are on furlough as well, right? Well, now I'm, I'm looking, hold on. <clears throat> so a DR is a, is a facility based activity. Um, yes. Right. Versus they could be reincarcerated for something like say they had a, um, a violation, right? Right. But that would show up as a different category. Okay, so this is just for folks who were mm -hmm. incarcerated. I'm just trying to determine if there was anybody in the community that, um, you know, did something that made it so they weren't allowed to earn their time. Yeah, I, I don't see that, but I will. I will go back and look. If, again, the only the only thing that would happen is that those people in the community have to be returned to incarceration. Right, so they, they can be in a community and have, you know, um, some other type of uh, violation that we respond to in, in the community, um, and that would not disqualify them from earning uh, their award that month. They have to have been returned um, to a facility to be disqualified. Yeah. And that, that, Karen, would be laid out within the rules. Is that it is, it is laid out in the rules. It's also in the law. Uh, so... And maybe I'm not asking my question correctly. I just think it is interesting to look at who is being, who is not earning the time in the right. community versus who isn't earning it in the facility. Because right. as we said, that with the min and the max, like what is the incentive and is it working? Is it only working for those who are incarcerated, but folks who are in the community aren't nope. earning their time? So I think well, that's the discrepancy. Luckily, um, I have some of my fine staff who are watching us on YouTube and who are doing uh, some uh, analysis for me. So here's, here's what my uh, <laughs> fine um, analyst has told me. Um, 700 people in the facility, 657 people in the field out of that total number that I provided to you. That's great. Thank you. That helps a lot. So it's really half and half. Okay, more, Monica, Dale, about the rules? Well, then the, the, the rule, if you want me to um, just continue so that we, you know, the, the, the rule basically lays out the, um, you know, who, who will get the good time, how we will prorate it, which was not in the uh, statute itself, but it's, it's a little bit more clear based on the number of days. Um, it talks a um, briefly around the fact that we will, um, as Eric mentioned, the law says that we have to no less frequently than 90 days notify an offender about their earned reduction of term. And so that is a, a, a process that we um, uh, are putting in place through our um, offender management system. So all of this information is recorded in the offender management system. Well, the law says, you know, we have to keep a record of it. And so we do that in our um, sentence 
computation module, more or less. Once a credit um, gets applied, um, we'll, we we will very shortly, this will be happening, um, be able to run a report. We'll print off the report and hand it to the offender so that they understand um, what their new min and max time looks like. So I know Kerr has a question, but I just, so these are the emergency rules and currently you're working on permanent rules. I am working on permanent which rules. Which will be yeah. very similar to these emergency rules, but may differ a little bit depending on whether or not we do S18. Is that fair to say? S18 will uh, cause a fair amount of um, rule making uh, flurry for us, in fact, <laughs> so, which I, you know, it's fine. We'll, we'll certainly take care of it, but the, there'll be a couple of things that we're going to need to do depending on the timing of when S18 passes. So, Kurt? Actually, that's kind of related to my question. The, the emergency rules expire, what, July 1st? Oh, gosh, the exact date, I think, is sometime in late June, right? Six, it's and 180 days. 180 June. days, yeah from January 1st. So we need to have, or somebody has to have rules in place at that point, right? Yeah, correct. And we are in the process of also going through final rulemaking for a permanent rule so that that permanent rule will be in place by the time this emergency rule uh, expires. And right now they're the exact same rule. They look exactly the same. Uh, and uh, okay, never mind. I'm trying to figure out what happens if S18 passes and things get jumbled again. But I guess that's what you'd be working on. Yes, and we are. We have some contingency plans for that and how how we would need to go about doing that. Um, but it will require a few more steps. Okay, thank you. Yep. So I'm looking at the time, folks. Um, I don't know if you folks are comfortable in shifting right into S18 right now, or if you'd like a five minute break or so before we do that, or what your thinking is. Because we can shift into S18 if people are comfortable and have enough background knowledge. Is that okay to shift into S18? That's gonna be my first question. I would like so, five minutes. Okay, I know that. I'm just trying to think. Do you want to shift into S18? Because if you don't, then we've got other things we can do too. Okay, so let's take five minutes and then we're going to shift into S18, which is the Senate bill that does the carve outs. Mm -hmm. 